All right. So, so we're, we're gathered here today to um, discuss managed services versus cloud operations. Um, and I've, I've invited Savas from, from AWS uh, um, so that we can together discuss what the differences are. Yeah, thank you, Detelina. And uh, I think, um, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to have this great uh, discussion. I think it's uh, it's a very interesting topic um, and a very hot topic at this moment. So I think we should start by clarifying a little bit these two terms for the audience, as there might be a little bit of confusion as to what they actually are and what they actually mean. So maybe if I can ask you, what do actually managed services do and stand for? Um, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, it's uh, I actually Googled it um, a couple of weeks ago and stumbled on the Wikipedia definition, um, which was giving all sorts of examples of managed services, one of which was for companies that uh, make sure your trucks are up and running so they take care of the the health of the trucks and it's it's a term that's used for a lot of industries so not just it and uh it, it means basically someone takes care of your stuff for you to put it simply uh, and in the sense of it um and infrastructure in particular it has um come to be associated with things like um, uh, ITIL-based processes, information technology uh, library, um, things like uh, uh, change approval boards, um, a, a lot of focus on um, incident management, alerting, um, slow and steady processes, and generally keeping things up and running in a reactive mode. Yeah, and that's actually not bad at all, uh, to be honest. Um, I like the example you gave about trucks. Uh, you, I used to have a customer that uh, was doing a lot of uh, things with Internet of Things and connected trucks. So staying up and running is a very important thing. Um, and I think a lot of customers require actually an information technology infrastructure uh, library, as you mentioned. However, they sometimes lack understanding and resources. How, um, how do you see that? How, could you maybe explain a little bit about uh, the ITIL um, framework? Yeah, um, if, if for anyone who has ever had to implement uh, ITIL or worse, work with ITIL processes that were implemented by someone else, um, you must have noticed that ITIL is very focused on delaying change and containing um, a, a status quo because uh, you may have heard the statistics about 70% uh, of all incidents are caused by changes. So I, ITO is super focused on planning changes and documenting them. I used to work in a company where our customers were banks and we would write like three page documents for a non-standard change we would go to a change approval board with people who understood nothing of the technology we were going to um, to to uh, make changes to and they would ask questions to figure out if we were ready to implement the change or not the whole change would take 30 minutes but we had like three days of preparation and you have to wait for the change approval board meeting uh, which it may be like uh, four days from now, so uh, creating this this lag so that you really think about it, so that you really prepare. Um, and this is very uh, incompatible with the way the cloud works because to me, um, the focus on in the cloud is all about change. Everything in the cloud is about uh, automatically scaling, automatically remediating things, automatically uh, growing or shrinking. E everything's about uh, uh, being as flexible as possible. So if I understand correctly, um, you're talking more as an infrastructure as a code? Is that also yeah, the application yeah. that you're And would that uh, be the big differentiator between managed services and cloud ops? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because 
um, when when we started, when I started in Helicot some three or so years ago, and were, was just building um, the then managed services organization, uh, I, I was trying actually um, to base it on ITO uh, to an extent, and uh, I quickly figured out that uh, with infrastructure as code, change management is a very different game, and it looks a lot more like uh, like software engineering than it does to your typical operations your typical managed services because when you make changes as code they are quickly reversible you don't have to worry about it so much it, they're pretty much self-documented um, because uh, everything's there in the code uh, you do need some context of course and, and all that but um, infrastructure as code is an absolute game changer and um, I, I, I have also seen this as um, something that not a lot of uh, uh, of managed services provider out there is, uh, are embracing um, because it's uh, it, it's sort of the comfort zone to uh, have code but continue to make all the changes through the console but that's the opposite to taking advantage of the cloud because uh, if you want to operate a, an automated environment you have to do it as code because you get the trackability you get yeah. the speed uh, I have forgotten when was the last time I, I saw someone logging on, on a, a server or a virtual machine or anything to change a configuration file and then other people were wondering like what was changed because you have to go and, 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 and check that and there was no log so we had to do all the, those three page documents and then still someone did a change somewhere while fixing an issue that was undocumented. That doesn't happen with infrastructure as code. And you, you know, I find it quite funny that you give this as an example because, you, you know, I used to work for a traditional IT provider and these are all very common aspects of what we were seeing as customers, right? So I, I think personally that the cultural aspect or culture in as a general term is actually one of the biggest challenges that we see so far with, with our customers. And um, it really means that they need to invest time and resources to basically change, uh, if I can play with a word, the mindset um, of their employees, of their own organization, and to implement those changes in a very efficient way. And um, I like the fact that you said about you know how you you take time to um, uh, work on on servers and do physical provisioning and all of that because that even the traditional and proprietary approach is is still a mindset. I as an engineer, I need to provision and physically need to put the USB on the server, uh, do the security patches, you know, configure the server, and then check, test, and run uh, the applications that I want to run. And this is still like uh, a very, I would say, and, and excuse my, um, my my way of thinking for the audience, but I think it's an old fashioned way. Uh, as you said, a cloud environment, a cloud operation is a continuous evolving process. And I think we really need to focus that. Um, but let me just pause there. Uh, I like the culture of aspect that you mentioned how do you see culture because i know that culture is quite important how does helicloud see culture how do you address it um we we had a a, a really big uh period where we were growing um people coming from different backgrounds either support engineers or uh, system administrators uh or um, another typical role into DevOps engineers. And we, we found that it's it's not a, a shift in mindset that everyone is ready to do, to undergo. Uh, because uh, some people like the, the comfort of of the old way of doing things where uh, you're responsible for this small set of things and, and you take your time and they don't change a lot because change is bad, because change is risky. Um, and all of a sudden you put these people in, in a, the very abstract cloud environment where everything's moving all the time and they can't be the Linux 
dedicated engineer that they used to be in their old job, all of a sudden they have to be responsible for all of the AWS services for and understand the entire AWS infrastructure. And not only that, but they have to manage it in, in a very abstract way with Terraform, with infrastructure as code, um, and with version control systems. I, I found version control systems were a, a very difficult step for, for people. And, and in the beginning, if I have to be honest, we had to spank people when they uh, they were going for the console to change something real quick because the customer wants it immediately. We can't bother with the code; it's all it's all slow. Because in the beginning, when when you're working with a new tool set, it's always slow and and, and tedious, and you always want to go back to the old way, like like eating with chopsticks. Uh, in the beginning, it's it's all it's all slow and difficult. You just want to take the fork and eat your Chinese food with it, exactly. but when when you when you learn it you have you have the sort of pride like look at me i can i can do this fancy thing now and and in the end a lot of them became this proud person look at me i'm managing everything as cold and you hear people i i i don't even know how this looks in the conzo i realized that i haven't looked at at, at the conzo itself for a very long time because they keep doing everything as cold <laughs> And yeah, and I, and I, about, yeah. about culture that I found really amusing is that the people who who managed to um, to embrace this this culture, they found AWS and the cloud so amazing that they uh, they became um, obsessed with the idea of modernizing everything all the time, of following the AWS news and and keeping in touch with what changed uh, here and what changed there. And we have like. Um, chat channels where people share AWS news or here's an open source tool that does this or does that. And, and they would get really frustrated if, if a customer was still using a monolith application or worse, an application that doesn't understand DNS because like, how can you still rely on a static IP address if you're in the cloud? Like, why are you on the cloud if you're still doing that? You have to, you have to update everything to be able to fully benefit from the cloud. Yeah, and that's and, and you're you're absolutely right. And I love you know the enthusiasm, and I love the paradigm the, the that you gave about culture. And and personally, I fully agree. And from experience, also with AWS, um, change is a very important aspect but it's also a very difficult one to 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 achieve change right people usually don't want to change or they're resistant to change and, and that could be uh, due to many different reasons however um i still believe and i think this is also the messaging that you will see from aws is that the cloud computing is a very fast pacing environment and it's difficult to stay still if you look at aws alone we have more than 200 different services and we're still adding services every year and every month um, just to make our customers life easier uh, but also to make the cloud operations easier um, so i believe it's all about speed you know efficiency and ultimately staff productivity for a company and freeing up your resources in order to focus on other innovations or other revenue streams that you could put your engineers instead of just having them there um, logging tickets and, and doing, I don't know, security patches, configuring servers. You could take them there, uh, put them in something else, something more meaningful for the for the company, develop code uh, and do true innovations. And I think that's what cloud ops is all about as well. Um, and in that notion, could you maybe tell me a little bit more about your focus as as HelloCloud and Cloud Ops? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, since we were talking about um, uh, definitions, uh, I wanted to give uh, the, the the definitions of, of cloud operations that are found online, online and it, it really resonated with the way I see cloud operations. Um, it's uh, basically an extension of DevOps and IT. The team focuses on achieving agility and speed by developing best practices and procedures for automating software delivery, application management, server management, and provisioning, and making everything available on demand from the cloud. This focus on automation and best practices with continuous improvement is, is our goal. 
um, because if you're only reacting to things, uh, very soon you're going to end up being bombarded with false alarms and with repeat incidents. And uh, in in a in the traditional managed services world, uh, this is sort of the norm. Uh, I remember in that same job where we were supporting banks, I was supporting the, the application layer and there was a different team supporting the infrastructure and um, one of the servers was rebooting unexpectedly every once in a while and I, I was like furious about it. <laughs> It, it was very annoying. It was for a customer that had very tight SLAs, and I, I worked for like months with the team, and they were like, "I'm I'm I'm sorry. Like we've checked all the logs and everything. We can't find the reason. Um, maybe we should wait for a more regular reboot pattern." Uh, was their suggestion, and I keep thinking about it. And this is this is so not the way we do things now because this was like one of three servers that was doing the same thing, uh, the same functions, only this one was rebooting, it was probably some uh, issue with the operating system uh, that is either caused by the way it was installed or configured or, or was some bug that was only seen on, on this machine, but you wouldn't see a, a problem like that and worry about it so much uh, in a cloud environment, would you? Because if you have a server that's giving you grief, you, you redeploy it you spin up a new server, yeah. see if yeah. you still have the problem. I, I really liked the analogy as I was starting, treat your servers as cattle, not, not as pets. Exactly. And, and I mean, uh, but but, but that, that, that bit about the incident management being very different, uh, it, it's not just that, you, you said it yourself, it's, it's super dynamic. AWS is working, uh, is, is spinning up very fast. And uh, if, if you're sitting in one place, you're automatically falling behind. So uh, to me, cloud operations is about um, making sure that the customers are up to date. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is why you have to have the holistic approach uh, on, on the infrastructure to uh, look at it from uh, all angles um, of the well-architected framework and make sure that you're updating things um, according to and anything that's changed in AWS. And I, I have to say that's not always easy because um, doing um, re-architecture, even with uh, the agility of the cloud and how flexible everything is and how quickly you could you could do it with like minimum downtime, it, it, it still costs money. And I, I think that's the challenge for a lot of the customers. It's not that, that uh, they uh, don't want to update things uh, and, and use the top-notch technology on top of AWS, it's, it's that they haven't necessarily factored in the amount of investment that they'll continue uh, to do year over year to be up to date and, and, and have an optimal environment. Exactly. And, and I think you mentioned it quite well and, and you described it very well. Um, and it's even even when you talk about security, right? Compliancy, for example, um, you see it now happening as well. Standards, regulations uh, happen to change very often. So um, how do you also keep up to date with your own infrastructure? How do you stay compliant? Uh, but also cost optimization. I mean, come on, Detalina, who doesn't want to have their cost optimized, right? I would love that. I mean, if I was the owner, CEO of a company, I would definitely want my costs to be uh, decreased year over year. And, and I think that's also a very important aspect that, um, of course, cost plays a role, but ultimately it goes, as you said, about business agility and maintaining this evolving environment uh, and being really uh, up to date with it, right? So I think that's a very important uh, aspect of it. So. How how did HeliCloud come with cloud operations? Um, it was actually not my idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we did a, a team workshop because uh, um, uh, we we wanted to hear what um, what what engineers were were experiencing while working with the customers, what we could improve in the team in our work together, um, and one of the things that really stood out. Uh, was that people did not feel support engineers. They did not feel that this, this described them very well. They did not feel that managed services described them very well. Um, and it was actually the team that came up with it. And um, we, we were like, 
yeah we should we should just change the name of the department change the name of uh, the names of the roles and um it it did have a very positive effect on us because it wasn't just a change of the name it was actually adjusting the title uh to correspond to what people were actually doing because um like one person was saying i'm i'm a devops engineer i've i've read the definition I, I spend all of my time <laughs> in PyCharm writing code and automating stuff. I'm not a, an infrastructure support engineer. That's not, that's not what I am. And and this is uh, this is basically how it happened. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, and and I think that's also a very great development because cloud operations and cloud computing as a whole uh, as we said and i don't want to reiterate myself every time but um it's it's a continuous and evolving process right so you need a framework in place you need a team in place that can manage and and cope with these uh, changes um and as we said in the beginning of this uh, discussion uh change is one of the most defining factors in this whole process of cloud operations uh, you know a company can really afford to deploy high impact internal resources um, on day-to-day -day management of their cloud environment and uh, it's because, because it's very costly right so they want uh, cloud ops to basically handle those daily operational tasks at a near constant uh, uh, pace uh, they don't want destructions uh, they want to be pulling out engineers and developers out from the core, the core tasks um, to drive growth and innovation for their business. And I think partners like HeliCloud uh, are really important in taking away such complexity, complexity sorry, um, where, where you continually monitor, maintain and optimize our, our customers' AWS environment. And mm. um, I think that's a very important aspect also in our partnership as well, right? Yeah, yeah. What what I've noticed is that uh, only companies that do not require 24-7 um, can afford to do this in-house. Uh, and of, of course, it depends on the size of the infrastructure and everything. Uh, but first 24-7, you need at least five people to do a, a rotation, either on call or, or, or on shift uh, and a legal rotation <laughs> uh, so that they can cover the full 24 seven. And um, that's only part of it. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the keeping up to date uh, uh, because um, as we said over and over again, AWS is constantly changing. And if you put people who used to manage your data center environment to manage your cloud environment uh, without preparing them for this amount of change that is going to happen, um, they're not, uh, they're just going to use their forks <laughs> to, uh, exactly. to, to eat the Chinese food and they're never going to, to learn uh, the new ways because they will not see the advantage. And, and also uh, what really helps us as an organization is um, that all of the, all of how the cloud is AWS focused. So um, as I mentioned, we have these uh, common chats where engineers share stuff about AWS. It, it, it really is uh, a large ecosystem of people uh, and processes and tools, uh, like like a cloud center of excellence, where uh, where people can um, help each other out with with AWS. And while everyone is an AWS expert, right, with all of its services and all that, we do have people focused on uh, particular technologies like. Um, network and security are two uh, fields that you need someone who's deep into it um, mm -hmm. and you can't do with the general well, AWS expert alone. You need someone who understands the BGP routing protocol and uh, other uh, complex protocols. And for security, you need someone who um, understands the Mitri attack and, and, and all that. And, and having a, a partner um, who has all of this expertise is invaluable but the other thing as well is that through the years we have automated a lot of stuff um, because when you when you do things for a, a very long time you start um, 
noticing things that are uh, repeating, like, hmm, we could we could save some time by automating this, or uh, and and this could be a way to um, estimate uh, cost savings, uh, or it could be a way to uh, optimize the monitoring solution, or it, it could be like a Terraform module for um, for backup, Terraform module for patching, things like that. Like we've we've, we've ended up with um, uh, a bunch of, of uh, automated solutions that we deploy during onboarding that basically take care of the automated housekeeping so that uh, engineers can be uh, um, busy with uh, reactive stuff for the customer and not so much for for the environment so the environment itself would uh would be monitored by them of course but it would patch on its own back up on its own um we even have housekeeping stuff for for cost governance like uh, stopping and starting environments during the night during the weekend um deleting or orphaned uh eps volumes uh we we developed an automation to uh destroy all resources in sandbox and environments on Friday evening because people forget to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, so so it's it's people, it's processes, and then it's tools and in the face of uh, these automations. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for explaining that, Adelina. And if if the time allows us, I, I, I think I also have a very great example of how this um, managed services versus cloud operations is, is happening in real life, right? So um, I used to have a customer and we you mentioned in the introduction that I'm also um, uh, subject matter experts in maritime solutions. So I used to have a customer that was a ship owner. And as you know, like a, a ship is a floating IT data center. Um, and to update their databases and even do like a simple security update or, or a firmware update would take them a week. And they would do that only until they uh, docked their ship at uh, at one of the ports. And uh, although they were using a hybrid cloud infrastructure, uh, and they were using actually the right connectivity, uh, sat satellite communications were just too expensive to do all these updates and to to really focus on backing up replication and all of this stuff. So what you were seeing is that first of all, the IT engineers, IT engineers that were on board the ship did not have the right capacity to address those issues and they were not trained properly, uh, but also they didn't anticipate the, the threat, uh, the physical, where the cyber that one ship could, could have, right? So uh, think about the many sensors like a ship has. Uh, an average ship might have like 100,000 different sensors. So that means different data sources, uh, but also different ports uh, or, or, or ways to penetrate the system. So even a security update, as I said, would, be, uh, would have a tremendous impact and a negative influence to this company. Um, so changing them, for example, to more of a cloud operation, um, that would be of a huge benefit. And, and there are use cases where, where this has been done successfully, but it was also the mindset that you had to change, right? Because a ship or the ship operations are proprietary and very traditional environment. And people always say, yeah, cloud, cloud is too expensive, cloud is too complex for me. I don't want to implement it. I don't have the staff. I don't have the, the capabilities. Uh, but ultimately what they just need is someone to guide them through the process. Uh, someone to help them implement the change and they need a partner like you that can help them with the whole uh, maintaining and, and updating the system. And there are a lot of uh, successful use cases where, where we impl implemented that together. Um, but I think but I think it's also uh, uh, quite important when we talk to our audiences to, to always uh, point out the cultural aspect because it is a huge undertaking. And it's not, as you mentioned, Detalina, it's not a simple process. It's an involving process, it's an automation, right? So we really need to, to put focus on that part. Um, mm. I don't wanna to take too much of your time, um, but I would like to, to, uh, to understand a little bit like, so when you change your name, did you also change the portfolio? Oh, yes. 
um, yeah, yeah, we did, and it was again uh, driven largely by the team because they're working with customers all the time. So they were the the people who had the um, the observations on what customers need versus what we currently offer them. Uh, we used to have a, a portfolio that was modular. So uh, you would pick, for example, um, service and data availability, like the like uh, possibly similar to the resilience uh, pillar of the well-architected framework, or you could choose performance, or you could choose cost, or you could choose security. And uh, there, there were, of course, customers who chose all of the modules, but uh, there were customers who would go for the bare minimum, like, I want resilience, and that's it. Or I choose security over costs. <laughs> and I have to say, everything's super interrelated, like, cost and performance from the well-architected framework, they're two sides of the same coin. Because one is about provisioning for cost and the other one is provisioning for performance and you're provisioning once. So you have to you have to be able to, um, to satisfy both conditions uh, to, to do it properly. Because if you over provision, oh, awesome performance, everything's great, but your costs are not looking very good. Or if you under provision, maybe you would be happy with the costs, not with the performance. And uh, another thing is you can, um, there's something fundamentally different about provisioning resources in the cloud. Everyone knows that. We used to, um, we used to like uh, complete forms uh, of how many servers with what, <laughs> <laughs> with what memory and CPU we wanted and send that to uh, the team that did the procurement and you wait a couple of weeks, you get them, that, that's fine. You, you never really learned how, how much things cost. Well, maybe you did a little bit yeah. at some point when you were higher up in the hierarchy, but that wasn't your problem because you're an engineer. All of a sudden, everything that you create, you, you provision it yourself. If you if you continue to not care about the cost, that becomes an issue. But it also becomes an issue about security, uh, because you can spin up um, a VM to test something. Obviously, in the production account, that's where you're going to spin it up, uh, because it has the right uh, network setup, just like the production server does, and and it has the best testing conditions. And what are you going to do after the test? Destroy it? Oh, sure. Yeah, you're you're totally going to remember to do that. And that's not a problem with uh, about cost alone. It's a problem about security as well because a exactly. lot of the security attacks um, in the cloud happen because someone forgot a resource running. And of course, we've all heard the joke uh, um, that cloud is not pay for what you use. Is it's pay for what you forgot to turn off. But with security. That's a very big price to pay. Um, exactly. So, so we, we learned at some point that whatever module customers signed up for, they had pretty much the same needs. So they all needed you to act on a security incident, whether or not they have uh, the security module uh, or not. Uh, they, they all expected you to help them with a cost incident. And this can be like a, a real, tough one to crack because all of a sudden it's a very high bill and, and and trying to understand how that happened is not always transparent um and and with performance issues and and things like that as well so we were like we should we should give the well architected framework to everyone like everyone gets all five pillars um because otherwise it's like asking customers to choose between a steering wheel and brakes like which one do you want <laughs> in your exactly. car i love the like, comparison by the way yeah yeah it's, it's my um when i was on maternity leave i had a replacement and he, and he came up with that and i will continue to use it thank you <laughs> georgi <laughs> i love that yeah so so we were like we should be like car companies we should give everyone a fully functioning car and they get to pick the level of of luxury and the level of, of luxury um that we defined was twofold uh, one is uh the number and type of automations that do the housekeeping vary so for example the essential steer would get standard backup patching um uh, security hub uh, uh, one control like CIS, just making sure that, that we have the essentials covered, 
performance dashboards uh, and things like that. And then the premium tier would, would get like annual failover testing against which we measure our RTOs and RPOs. Um, uh, full-blown security hub configuration, any con controls you can think of with automated remediations, if you're brave enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, uh, like the cost forecasting, we, we developed uh, cost anomaly detection, all the AIML stuff. Uh, and uh, we we were quite uh, quite pleased with the end result. Actually, uh, the most of the the automations we developed uh, uh, was either because uh, we saw uh, a customer need that had to be fulfilled. Like we had one customer who was like, "I need cross account, cross region backup." And we're like, "That's a very good idea. We should totally develop that." <laughs> and 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 that's how that came to be. Uh, and uh, uh, the other the other stream um, from which uh, we we started developing automations was actually the managed services program uh, by AWS. We started preparing for it I think two years ago, and um, AWS is uh, calling it the next generation managed services providers. And when I read that, I was like, Ah, you're on to yeah. something. You don't want to call it managed services either, do you? <laughs> but, haven't you haven't replaced the name yet <laughs> and it's a cool uh, name that's why we keep it uh, like that it's a cool name <laughs> next generation yeah. right so. next gen yeah it, 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 it is a cool it is a cool name but yeah the the program has some really cool requirements about using kiml and monitoring and um we started specializing in, in that we had a couple of people um one at first and and, and then more people joining in um in in developing uh, predictive monitoring um uh forecasting so for example a dashboard where you see the last three months of uh, of your cost data that can be split by service uh, or by uh, a particular tag like environment or application and then you see a forecast of the next three months so like aha uh -huh, this is um my x application and it's going to increase or decrease in cost um and also um Anomaly detection alarms can be really good for uh, um, metrics where you have uh, uh, seasonal trends, like all of your users log in at the exact same time in the morning, then they forget about the system for the whole day. If yeah. it's threshold based, you're you're screwed. But if it's an anomaly detection alarm, it will know, ah, this is normal, it's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> a, a, a lot of the stuff we actually developed because, because of the, the managed services partnership program. Yeah, and you, you know, I really like this analogy and the paradigm that you gave um, because I do believe that customers want something like a total overview of, uh, first of all, where their resources are being used and also what kind of costs they're incurring. And this is one of the things I like and I love actually um, about AWS and, and what we do with our partners, right? So um, one of the, I would say the, 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 the guiding pillars is, is also not gas capacity and we give our customers really a broad choice of um, resources and tools that they can use. Um, even if you look, for example, at what you mentioned, like, okay, there are engineers that like to play with things, right? So we give our customers, for example, the choice to choose a processor uh, when you talk about EC2 instances. Um, I don't think there are a lot of other cloud providers that are actually doing this. You can play with AMD, you can play with Intel, you can play with ARM, um, Graviton, you know, all of these uh, different concepts, all of these different technologies, which basically gives you the flexibility to uh, to innovate and 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 to 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 really develop something, but you can also see um, how you're utilizing the re the resources. And for a CEO or for CFO, uh, it's it's really easy to utilize all these tools that uh, HeliCloud, for example, is using or AWS is using um, to 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 put them in picture and to gain a, a holistic view of their infrastructure and what they're using. At the end of the day, um, as you said, you don't want to be ordering components like extra memory, extra processor, extra capacity for your server because, yeah, you just 
don't know what to expect. You just anticipate that you're going to have more workloads, but you don't actually know what kind of workloads there are going to be. So you're just ordering something and then it takes three to four weeks uh, to get that component. And it's a very actual example that you gave. And being from, as I said, from a, a traditional IT company, I really know how these things go and uh, that you have to go into special approvals and then you have to monetize this whole process. Um, so I really love the example you gave. You know what the 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 romance associated with uh, the old style IT company is, where you have that guy, uh, let's let's call him Jake, that understands your entire application end to end. Everyone wants that. Like exactly. it's not scalable, obviously. Get <laughs> sick, <laughs> people. People uh, will approve his vacation request occasionally, um, and and maybe one day uh, he will decide to do something else in a different company. But until then, you have Jake, and he knows everything about everything. the application, yeah. and and that's what everyone wants, and that's why why they find it super challenging to decide to give the wheel to someone else and like, okay, you drive because you're the AWS expert. I don't care if you're an AWS expert. I want people to understand my application, my processes, and my company. Exactly. And I, I find this a very reasonable uh, demand uh, from, from customers, which is why uh, ever since we started, we, we always had a single point of contact for every customer. And what this engineer does is they specialize in knowing everything about this customer so that they can cascade to everyone else in the team uh, and uh, also be this very knowledgeable person that uh, when the customer talks to them and say, uh, just uh, uh, restart uh, X uh, on Y and he'll be like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and this is, I think, this is a, a a real, really important point to our to our service that uh, it is a shared service. But we we and the customer both benefit from having this Jake person uh, who who will understand the system uh, and the, the the environment, the applications, and their and and the people from the customer's team as well better than everyone else. And exactly. this. This is the the other aspect of of our tiers. Uh, we we decided it made sense to not just play with the level of luxury in terms of automation, but in terms of the service as well. Um, so uh, everyone everyone gets a Jake. <laughs> um, but uh, for for example, you get different SLAs, you get um, different number of of meetings uh, because there are customers where uh, things are not as dynamic uh, as they are with others, and they can be on the essential tier. We touch base once a month, decide on priorities, backlog things like that, move on. There are customers we talk to several times a week. <laughs> I can imagine. There's so yeah, many. They they really appreciate that. That's uh, I think a major selling point to us. I think I think they appreciate that more than they appreciate the automations because you don't see the, the automations. You think about them if if they miss fire or something or. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> it, it's about the people, but yeah, that's uh, back to the the culture as well. It, it's uh, um, it's about building this this team with full of full of experts and and you can have a dedicated expert for for everyone but still tap into the knowledge of everyone else in the company exactly so the scalability of is what we offer exactly. <laughs> exactly that's one that, that's one actually of the key strengths i think like uh, combining all these multidisciplinary uh, uh, teams or, or people into one uh, holistic whole right so um it's 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 i think a, a great strength and you know the, the, you know, first of all you explained to me a lot about managed services you explained to me about cloud ops what you do in this um space and, and how you can address that um and maybe this is a trick question and i apologize in advance for that but if you had to choose uh one industry or one type of customer to apply let's say cloud ops um what would that be i wouldn't choose based on the industry i would choose based on whether uh, they want to innovate 
uh, and uh, they they are looking for the best practices in the cloud or they are looking to be on the cloud. Uh, I've, uh, it's a spectrum, of course. You get uh, customers uh, where the, the CTO seems to be constantly reading online and be like, oh, let's try this. And, and I have to say, our engineers love that type of customer. They may whine sometimes that uh, uh, they have like 10 different changes that they need to work on this, this week, but then with pride, they would join a meeting and be like, yeah, we've tested that. We're the pioneers in everything and with, with this customer. <laughs> Very good, I see that a lot. Yeah, I've I've come to learn that the the win-win uh, for us is, is with, with customers that understand the, that that you 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 can't just reside on the cloud. You can't just put your applications on the cloud and pff, we're done. Like it's not it's not like you've you've built a house and you move in and that's it. Like you you constantly you, it, it's a car. You, you constantly have to change the oil, uh, pimp it, um, like <laughs> remove the limit for the speed. You're like you're a teenager with with a super fast car and you constantly want to drive want it as to fast. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Yeah, as fast as possible and uh like you have to you have to love it you have to to think of it in, in this way because if you're just using the cloud and and not not trying to to use it with with the cloud tools and and with the right processes it may as it may very well be a lot more expensive to you than being on a data center so exactly. you either you either fully embrace it or or you don't and and we want the customers that that fully embrace it exactly and and to just sum it up you also take them to this cloud journey right so you nurture them and you 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 guide them through this because i think that's something that we missed here right so um yeah it's 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 all great what we are discussing and i think it's it's amazing that we can do this that we have the possibility to do this but there are a lot of customers still out there that first of all don't trust the cloud uh, but second of all don't really have the right knowledge or the resources so it's our task uh, to really help them and guide them through the whole cloud journey process and uh, so that they can see the benefits for example of, of their operations and they can become more agile and, and digitally transformed, as the cliche word uh, says. But um, I really love this. And yeah, I mean, personally, I, I learned a lot today. And uh, I, I think uh, you did a great job explaining the managed services versus uh, cloud ops. And um, yeah, I don't know if, if you have any other questions for me, but it was uh, yeah, there's one one thing that I, I, I think I forgot to touch upon. Uh, one one of the things that surprised me when I when I joined Head Cloud was um, I, I, I wasn't used to working with the terms managed services and professional services. I came from companies where it was a delivery department and some people were doing uh, uh, support, some people were doing implementation, but it was one delivery department. And uh, I, I soon came to understand that um, there's uh, this industry trend where you, you call your departments managed services and professional services. And uh, at the same time, they have very similar skill sets, uh, but very different delivery models. And I, I like joking that professional services is like the, um, the fling uh, where you go out with someone for a, a short time um, and and then you're you're off everyone on your on your separate ways and and managed services is like the marriage um, where you exactly. build the long term relationship and uh, marriages only work if if one of the if both of the people are constantly improving because marriages yeah. need the dynamics uh, upwards and not downwards. <laughs> <laughs> and they're both committed as well, right? So yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing that I I really hated about the the managed professional services um, distribution of departments, and it was uh, one of the reasons as well for uh, renaming managed services to cloud operations was that when you have a job candidate and they have to pick between managed and professional services, zero people are going to choose managed services because 
like whatever you call this the other one is professional it sounds sexy managed services <laughs> it sounds so much better right so people call sexy <laughs> like it, 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 it's it's just it's giving it a bad reputation uh, the the name it, itself and um i I, I, I think uh, it really helped us uh, to 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 call it something something different, so that people feel that they're not inferior, and uh, and so that candidates uh, can can think of this as well, job candidates as as something other than a support job, because it's not a support job. And I think one of the biggest challenges that companies are going to to find is that everyone wants to be an architect and everyone wants to work on projects and be a professional services engineer because that's sexy. Um, but there's there's a lot to be said about doing the continuous optimization in a, in a cloud operations department, because when you're you're doing uh, just the architecture, just the lift and shift, it's a hit and run. Exactly. You get a very fixed budget, fixed requirements, you work with the customer at a particular time in their journey where they have a fixed budget and a, and a, and a certain understanding of what the cloud has to offer. They're not yet ready yet for um, the big changes, not ready yet for uh, turning their um, monolith and into a microservices application or <clears throat> or ditching the database on EC2 and going for an RDS. This is something that happens in cloud operations. So uh, we are making uh, the continuous improvement month by month. We work with the customer to embrace the, the changes and, and to improve things for the better. So I, I think that is something that people want. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we see it all the time, right? We see it all the time in the market. And I think, um, and again, uh, I, I'm reiterating myself, but we mentioned this so many times, and 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 I think it's it's the business agility and uh, being part of, uh, if you may say so, like managed services. You're actually being a facilitator of change, and that's mm -hmm. a big task. That's a big task because you're not an engineer, you're not an architect, you are the 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 person that is responsible for the transformation of the business. And it's a very heavy burden. And I think a lot of people underestimate, as you said, the uh, the responsibility that falls upon them. And um, when, when we try to implement change, we're gonna find a lot of um, um, you know pushbacks, a lot of uh, pitfalls. We're gonna find people that resist change, um, but change is most of the times a good thing. You know, because we talk about growth, we talk about innovations, uh, but we also make through the managed services um, an easier overview for our customers on security and compliance, uh, cost optimization, which are also very important facts uh, or, or aspects, sorry, for the business itself, right? So we want to be profitable, we want to be secure, but we also want to be a facilitator of change. And this continuous process, this this evolving process, is uh, a very critical uh, part of what we do within cloud operations, and and what you as HeliCloud can facilitate for our customers. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's as you said, it's a marriage. So both parties need to be committed. It's not only that. Yeah, we push for it because we think it's better. No, you really have to believe in it as a customer to implement it and then say you know what i understand i see and and i want to invest time and resources into making this a success and then you go hand in hand in these cloud operation environment right so um yeah, yeah that's basically summing it up a little bit thank you thank you for the summary service and it has been a super pleasant conversation i apologize i've been almost left without a voice <laughs> But yeah, you've been uh, um, a, a very nice partner in this um, um, in this conversation. I, I I hope we've cleared the terms and um, made it uh, a, a apparent that uh, managed services is a thing of the past. Now it's uh, it, it's a different world in the cloud. It has to be called differently, and and people who support cloud environments uh, deserve a lot of respect. 
because uh, you get to operate, operate something that is um, very complex, very dynamic. It's like trying to put an octopus into a net. It's just <laughs> yeah. all my respect for, for the team. And um, I want to also thank all, all of our customers for, for their trust in us um, and staying with us in this marriage. <laughs> And um, yeah, I wish uh, everyone a very pleasant week. And you, uh, I wish uh, an awesome birthday presentation. Uh, thank, you so much, yeah. thank you so much, Adelina. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your time and discussion. And it's been a true pleasure to uh, to be on this webinar.